Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. This week's oh. Painting of the Week, I think, should actually be a photograph of Laura's felt tip pen collection <laughs> because that is really quite something. I know. They are. They are. <laughs> As I was just saying, more weapon than pen. <laughs> I feel like you've made me grow up, grow up, though, Phil, because why, I did... Well, why, I started off... Why have you got off, a photocopy of a human heart? Well... You're coming on to that, OK. No, I'm not sure I am. I no. was, it's, it's more of a question for you. Because when I have to... Uh, we, we've gone... Should we go... Because we've gone straight... You've gone into my notes and it's not, well, worth, let me it's just, not worth it, Phil. Let me just start off by saying today <laughs> we're going to talk about The Jewish Bride by Rembrandt. <laughs> It's about 1665 to 1669, the paintings at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. <laughs> but I am intrigued to know why you have a photocopy, colour photocopy of a human heart. Well. Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not Valentine's Day. No, it's not. Well, okay, Phil. Yeah. Um, so you, you say to me, today, Laura, we're going to do the Jewish Bride, yeah. Rembrandt, obviously. Yeah. You know that potentially I'm not going to... I don't know. Did you think that I knew this painting? Uh, I mean, I really feel like I should have done well, after doing a no, bit of I research. Never, I never feel that. I never feel anyone should okay. do anything particularly. And I, and I sometimes panic now that, as a person, that I would have gone into an art gallery and looked at that, thought, yeah, I really love it, nice. I'm right. sure in the, in the flesh and everything it's going to really be beautiful colours and everything else. All right. And then, of course, I have to look and think, well, OK, I've got to speak to Phil this week. And think, yeah. and I got caught up, and I think I must have got caught up in a few things. And obviously this is a really, really important painting. And then somebody had made this association that if you divided that painting into four it would actually represent a human heart. Oh, my God. The Lord. way, yeah. See, I mean, it's really... <laughs> you see, I actually think I need to go and put the kettle on, have a cup of tea and settle down, because you haven't got that, have you? You, you haven't got this in your notes. OK, so let's, let's examine that. Actually, let me just point out... Yeah. I've got notes and felt tips galore. Yeah. And you've actually got nothing at all, Phil. No, well... This shows the difference... <laughs> This shows the difference between us, doesn't it? Yeah, your your <laughs> your statements are based on research. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but look at what I've got. What I've come up with. Well, <laughs> okay, so let's examine that theory because I, I always think theories should I mean, first should be tackled with the sen- you know with common sense. Mm, it's so, quite it's quite a vague theory, but I well, obviously watched. Um, he has he uh, has his hand on her heart, mm. and. It is possible that he is, you know, listening to her heartbeat, albeit through a relatively thick dress. Mm. But would Rembrandt have known what a human heart looked like? Oh, no, I hadn't thought I mean, that, see. I mean, we know that Leonardo, I mean, he took quite, quite extraordinary risks to be able to look at cadavers and cut them open and stuff. That really wasn't allowed by the church. That's Italy, that's 150-odd years earlier, maybe a bit more. Um, I'm not sure. I mean... No, this I mean, is going well, to be somebody else's point of view. But I mean... That they've looked at that painting and felt that it represents a heart. But we do know from other, other Rembrandt paintings that he did look at um, human anatomy and, indeed, animal anatomy. Um... I'm getting my artist confused. He didn't paint. He didn't. No, I think I've got gone. I've got. We've been doing too many podcasts. He didn't paint well, anybody in an actual operation, did he? I've got that wrong. Well, no, I've got that wrong. Okay, I think what we need to do. There's Phil, the famous one where he's there and the, 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 there's a group of guys analysing the, uh, actually looking uh, at the, the ligaments. Yeah. Of a hand. Yeah. Okay, and that was Rembrandt. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm doing quite well. Um... <laughs> So you're thinking of um, the anatomy lesson of um, Nicholas Nicolais 
Tulp. Yep. From about thirty years earlier. So. And the and the and I think the, the, he's painted some, a group looking at a dead like a. a I think he was a criminal. Oh. And they were they were, look, they were looking at the um, looking at his arm. Okay. And how you know different leg, ligaments mm. and tendons work the fingers and so forth. So I mean, this theory is obviously something I just looked at, and unfortunately for me, I well, have to. Years so, ago, I would have gone to the reference library. So we know this is the Jewish bride, mm. and. What I remember about this is that he's a wealthy Jewish merchant and this and taking his young bride. Um, this actually was the image we used for our poster for our Rembrandt film, um, which was centred on a major, major exhibition at the National Gallery in London and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. I think where you have to start with a painting like this is just to look at it. And again, I always say this, but imagine a, imagine a blank canvas. And then you start looking at this and you think, I mean, just that, you look, at, look at the arm. I mean, that you can feel the weight of that material. How you create that with paint is quite extraordinary. Oh, I it think. is, it is. And no, the thing about is. Rembrandt, for some, he is the greatest artist of all time. And I think... Why he, would, that, would that be because of portraits? It would partly be because of portraits and the emotion and the characterization within them, including mm. his own self-portraits. Mm. I mean, when we think about the history of self-portraiture, there are some great, great artists. Dürer does some fantastic ones, but really Rembrandt in particular, uh, and then Van Gogh. Um, but Rembrandt, obviously somebody you can track his entire life through his self-portraits. And he had... He had an extraordinarily, extraordinary life full of ups and downs, success, failure, loss. Well, because we did the podcast, didn't we, on the Night Watch? Mm. And that was, that became famous because he kind of mixed it up a bit. Because he didn't just do a painting of a group of people just all standing sort of straight. He yeah. put all that movement into it. and it's full of energy and mm. noise and narrative. Mm. And, this and is... wasn't that a bit of sort of ahead of his time as such? When he um, did that, yeah, 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 in some ways, yeah. Mm. But this is this is the technical mastery of this. You know, you can look at any part of any element of this painting, the two characters, and just look closely, and it's quite quite extraordinary. Um, if you can go in, if, if you're looking at this at the seventh-art.com website, or even on YouTube where we, the podcast also runs and you can see the picture there. But just zoom in, either just look closely or actually physically zoom in on any element of the material. And you'll just, it's almost beyond, I think, comprehension how yeah. fine and finessed it is. And then you look at their hands, beautifully rendered, the jewellery, exquisite. And then their faces. And there's a mystery about this painting. You know, what are they thinking? They're not looking at each other. It's a very tender touch between them. Um, he's obviously older than her. Well, I um, went right back because... Uh, I went, OK, so I've got a lot of notes here, Phil. OK, crack on. <laughs> and the, they won... So one that some people were saying about... Um, one of the reasons the painting became so famous was because of what Vincent van Gogh said when he said, I know, have you heard this before? I should be happy to give 10 years of my life if I could go on sitting here in front of this picture for a fortnight with only a crust of dry bread for food. Have mm. you heard that before? No. OK, so that's what I thought made this painting then mm. become... Um, sort of like really popular which is annoying that you haven't heard because well, I, I was quite hoping that you had because oh, okay. then I was wondering did he see something in that painting As I would imagine that people would see something in that painting because there's definitely a tenderness about the two, the couple that people would then relate to because it does look like a really lovely, they are in love and everything else um, and it went the, another Another part of the story was, well, okay, they think it now dates back to um, 
uh, one of the Old Testament stories, yeah. and uh, Isaac and Rebecca, yeah. who loved each other deeply but weren't allowed to show it, so they pretended mm. to be brother and sister. Mm. And that's why they're in that pose. Well, all right, answer the first part of that. Sorry, what, Phil. What, no, no, but what Van Gogh is seeing here mm. is just the mastery of the use of paint. This is three-dimensional. This is sculpted. He's using, he's, he's using his hands. He's using the palette knife. Right. He's pushing paint around. He's smudging it. He's smearing it. He does, on various of his paintings, he'll smudge stuff around the edges to make it... You know, he's, he's replicating the sense of things being out of focus. Sometimes with painters, everything's in focus, mm. which, of course, it isn't. No. Um, we, we're used to now, or anyone that's got any kind of photographic awareness will know that a lens will focus on a certain part of an image and the near focus or the distant focus can be soft. Um, that's still not clear to somebody if you imagine those Zoom calls where people defocus the background. So it's called depth of field and it gives a three-dimensionality to a, 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 a photograph. Well, artists, they, they, their skill is looking so... Sometimes if, um, uh, uh, if Rembrandt, for example, is depicting a table, the, near corner, the nearest corner to you will be deliberately smudged and blurred and the brush strokes will be wider and to make it seem soft, make it seem like the painting is three-dimensional. As you go back into the painting, things become closer near, finer brush strokes, get more in focus and then maybe the far distance goes soft again. So here, obviously, it's very obvious, but... They're in a pool of light. They're very detailed. The background is dark, almost. It's not completely black. There's something going on. If you look carefully, you can try to decide what it is. It, they look to me like they're in a, a garden, perhaps. or But very deliberate, making yeah. that a three-dimensional image. Um, so Van Gogh, who, you know, we've made films about Van Gogh, and Van Gogh is a misunderstood artist. He was absolutely determined to be the best artist he could possibly be and that involved reading everything he could about art talking to people endlessly about art to the point that they became actually kind of irritated with him <laughs> Gauguin in the south of France was persuaded to go down but he was overwhelmed with Van Gogh's passion to just talk about art and paint and analyse and critique the whole time yeah um and Van Gogh, like all great artists, every single great artist goes to galleries and studies. So, you know, Van Gogh is, goes to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and he stands in front of this painting, assuming, oh, I don't know, I don't know where actually... I'll, I'll, where step, it, I'll step back from that. I don't know where it would have been. No. Oh, no, sorry, it would have been the Rijksmuseum. Right. In the mid-1800s, um, to, to the best of my knowledge. Anyway, he stands in front of it and he thinks, oh, my God, how do you do that with... Now, of course, Van Gogh's style is very different. Yeah. You look at when we did the film about young Picasso, it's fantastic. There's this period in his youth when he's just copying other people's styles. So he, he paints a Velazquez like a Velazquez. He paints a Van Gogh like a Van Gogh. He paints a Seurat like a Seurat, etc., etc. Just learning how they did it. And then he's like, okay, now it's time for my own style. Um, it's interesting that he would have picked that paint out of all the Rembrandts then. That he was so keen on that one, though. Oh, yeah, I would have just imagined that he. It is actually quite amazing that there was that statement, and then I couldn't find anywhere else that said why he said that. And I thought, well, that's really odd, isn't it? it was, uh, there must have been something about the two people that he. No, I, I think you again. You think it's more to do with the, the. I think even even just that arm. Yeah. Is just mm. it's it, again. It is something, isn't it? The more you look at it, the more yeah, remarkable yeah. it is. Um, I mean, you're right about the name, and obviously we we have to be careful with names. Um, again, Hopper's in my mind. Hopper himself says, "I didn't call that painting early Sunday morning. Someone else decided oh, okay. to call it that to help sell it." He said, "I wasn't even Sunday morning." Right. I mean, often paintings are given names by dealers to to help sell them, or by the new owners, or they arrive in a gallery and it rather than untitled by so and so, they they yeah. add a title. Mm. Um, this 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 Jewish bride was a name given in the nineteenth century where somebody just said, "Oh yeah, I think he's a wealthy Jewish merchant, and that's his young bride." But as you say, the the the, the more popular theory is the one that you've put forward about Isaac and and Rebecca, um, 
And I think that comes because there has been a drawing found that Rembrandt did about this time of, which I think is clearly Isaac and Rebecca. Yeah. Um, it's funny, isn't it, that they... So Rembrandt does a painting and then you would imagine that would tell somebody who's in the painting, what it's all about, or write it down. But they haven't. And so it's now left to us all to spend hours <laughs> and lots of felt-tip pens to try to work out the mysteries all the time mm. on these paintings. Why didn't... Well, why do you think that people didn't just write it down? What, mm. who, who, who was in the painting? Or would they prefer us to have a mystery? There was a BBC series recently where they basically made up the kind of hmm. autobiography of Rembrandt, as though he'd written down. And it was a bit odd because basically they'd just, they'd just taken the kind of received wisdom of the history and turned it into, I then did this and I then did that. But they, did, they, never, they never told the audience. So if, if you'd have come to it not knowing that this wasn't his real autobiography, you'd have thought these were his actual words. Oh, OK. I, was actually, I actually didn't like that. I thought that was wrong to do mm. that. It was misleading. Mm. But it did make you realise that there is very little written from Rembrandt and it therefore makes... I mean, there's some stuff, but it makes it hard. Uh, and, again, one of the advantages of doing later artists, again, like Hopper recently, is that you have the correspondence. Mm -hmm. In his case, his wife, yeah. Joe Niverson Hopper, described all the paintings and described who gave them the names and... and you know, it, 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 I think it really helps. Um, I don't, you know, to me, it'd be fascinating to know exactly what his intention was with this painting, who he was painting it for, were mm. these known people, is it all imaginary? A lot of his um, paintings you did know, like, OK, go back to the Night Watch, knew exactly who that was for, who commissioned it, what it was all about. When it's commissioned, yeah. Mm. And so it is weird. But it's um. But even there, it's got the wrong name because it's not a night. Oh watch. no! Mm. It's just because it's gone dark. <laughs> so, um, but they do know who commissioned it. So, is this one of your favourite Rembrandt paintings? Then? It is actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't. I didn't know it before we did the film. Do you know? I mean, is it because of the how clever it is, the painting itself, that you like it the most? Uh, I think it's the absolute exquisite nature of mm. the of the craft yeah yeah um and there is yeah. a, there's I, I mean there's clearly a he's clearly suggesting a tenderness between the two of them yeah i think it's quite lovely that they're not looking at each other and he's got his arm around her shoulder as well there i mean it is a very it is a very beautiful moment mm. and they clearly really you know the way she holds touches his hand and if his hand was just a little bit lower, you'd think mm. that she'd just told him that she was pregnant. Pregnant, yeah. So um, it is It is a beautiful... I mean, it is... It is yeah. the more, be, actually, I mean, the more you look at it, and here we go again. Could it be his daughter? Mm. Mm. I don't No, I don't think so. Dad, I just did so well at school. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think... I don't no, think that. I think no. they. I think they love each other. Yeah. There's a there's a definite tenderness. I mean, obviously he could love his daughter. She loves him, but. I mean, Isn't it nice to think people? Th I mean, it's obvious of, but you know, three hundred and fifty years ago. Mm. You know, we can be lost in thinking that you know all of our marriages were arranged and. Yeah. Short and brutal and, <laughs> but actually this and again, knowing a bit more about Rembrandt's own biography, which is we mm. we do know enough. Um, and he had his ups and downs in his relationships, for sure. Um, but he had a lot of quite a lot of loss, didn't he? Quite a lot of loss, but he also had quite a lot of love. Mm. And so again, maybe this is you know he's he's finding something within himself of his own experience, which he's putting into into paint. Yeah. Um, it is a it's a beautiful beautiful work. Did he end up sorry? Was he very wealthy and then end up yeah. uh, losing all his money? Yeah. So okay. his house in Amsterdam is fantastic to go to. You know, if only every artist, somehow their houses had mm. been 
secured for the nation. Yeah. It makes such a difference. So, you know, seeing Cezanne's studio, or um, in this case, seeing the house that Rembrandt lived in, and they have it full of objects that he would have had, and you can see the beds that he would have slept in, and there's one room where they still show you how they print made prints and there's another room where they show you how they mixed all the pigments and oh, where wonderful. they painted and yeah absolutely fantastic now he became very wealthy because he was getting all these commissions because obviously he was the best artist in the Netherlands at the time but then he blew it right then he went bankrupt um so I mean he knew it all so you know he Wife dying, taking up with his servant and children, and then it's just yeah. Know. That that I mean that is itself. So the house has it got his furniture? I mean, what's the furniture like then? Because obviously, I'm assuming he sold a lot of it then to. Yeah, I don't know. If, I I can't tell you sitting here whether the furniture is genuine. Oh, okay. Whether it was, you know, we need to there, go there when the museum bought it, mm-hmm. or whether it's been you know re. Re, uh, reinserted, right. And it gives you a sense. I think they would probably agree that it gives a sense of what the house was like when he lived in it, but it's not. Okay. Um, I mean, this whole period is very, very interesting because of, you know, you ask yourself why, why in the Netherlands, this low, low country, this low lying country, small, Western Europe. Why are they suddenly the the home of a Rembrandt, a Vermeer, yeah. and plenty of others? And actually, what you need to look at is the economic situation at the time, which was because they're on the coast, um, they are very talented sailors, and they make their way round to what we call the Spice Islands. Right. So they travel around, very dangerous trip, around Cape Cod, uh, Cape Cod, <laughs> uh, Cape Town, mm-hmm. make their way to Indonesia and, and around that area, bring back the spices. Spices are absolutely essential because there's no refrigeration and meat goes off and starts to smell. So sometimes these spices are just to obscure the taste of that um, or just to make food more palatable. Anyway... The Netherlands becomes hugely wealthy and you have all these rich merchants building their houses and they want paintings. Yeah, okay. And you have the Dutch Golden Age where there's an estimated five million paintings are produced. (laughs) Now, allied to that is that you are in a relatively Protestant Northern European country. So if it had been... Although the Spanish were, um, Spanish Empire kind of cre- crept up to this part of the world, but still, if it's if it was a Catholic country, then the kind of pictures that would be commissioned would be you know religious saints and yeah. stories from the Bible, and, and and maybe this is a little bit. But mm. what you get in Dutch art is much more attention to ordinary people. I think of Vermeer. Vermeer's paintings are of women with scales, reading a letter, pouring milk. Um, think of those other great Dutch yeah. artists, which were some, some of them are quite bawdy, or they're mm. playing instruments. Or So Rembrandt um, is painting uh, pictures of, you know, flayed oxes and I mean, whatever, varied stuff, self-portraits. But there's a market and they have money. Right. So he's getting these commissions. So the night watch, night watch is commissioned by these gentlemen who have the money to pay for a painting. They have these fine new buildings which have big enough walls. So the, he's working in an economic context in exactly the same way as Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo. They emerge because the Vatican and the Catholic Church is re-establishing its Christian empire in Rome, building these big buildings and they want decoration. Right. Exactly the same with me. I was fortunate. Um, I came out of film college when Channel 4 was born and they only worked with independent producers, so there was a bit of a market there. 
Whereas if that hadn't existed and I'd been trying to work my way through the BBC and Channel 4, uh, sorry, ITV, yeah. who only had in-house production teams established, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you now. So we're all determined by our economic historical context and Rembrandt's no different. Um, they also became masters of working in oils. So actually, when you look at Leonardo... Leonardo's paintings, um, he had, you know, the oil painting, the, the technique of oil painting had really only relatively recently arrived in Italy from the north, from the Netherlands. Um, so Leonardo was, he was used to doing watercolours. Right. Last Supper is mm-hmm. not a watercolour, sorry. Um, uh, um, he's painting onto drying plaster. But then he sees his paintings coming from Northern Europe and, you know, these oil paints and the luminosity. I mean, again, look at that painting. Look how the, the light is just emerging from the gold of his... It is lovely. ...of his arm. But or, like you say, if that's oil as well, you, you can just spend hours on it, can't you? Oh. You just must, keep adding and adding. This must have taken so much time. Mm. No, it don't mean... In actual fact, the best, real best Fresco part, painting, that's what best part right. of these paintings, this painting is actually the fabrics. Yeah. On her sleeve as well. Yeah. And on her dress. Maybe I shouldn't say that because I'm sure loads of people but love t- the, love the faces, but no, it's the, you it's could the, look at those materials. Fa- you think so? Oh, good. Yeah, they're totally, totally believable. Mm. I do think though, when you look at the hands, mm. they look like they've they look enormous photographic. Oh look, yeah. Look at the veins on his hand. Mm. And the delicacy of the touch on hers. That's what I think is amazing. Mm. That's why that heart um, mm. and that... Because that, that actually is where the hands are. They are mm. truly in love. Just by the way she's touching him. So maybe. So maybe, maybe all the, the hands are all representing the valves, you know. Well, that's the idea, isn't it? That's what, you, that's what you're well, telling it was, me. It was, well, yeah. I did see. I mean, like I said, back you know, in the old days... His, his right arm is the right <laughs> atrium and... Uh, you know, going across to oh, the God, left oh, atrium God. and down to the left ventricle yeah, and up to the I mean, right really? ventricle. And... I don't know. Maybe people might think that this is, it was an interesting... I watched a video. I, I sometimes do think, though, I know back in the day when we you had homework, we used, used to go to the library and look through books. Yeah, yeah. And now... I don't go to the library. I have no time to do that. I have to look on the yeah, internet. Yeah. And sometimes I find that a bit sad because yeah. I have to think, oh, OK, am I believing this one or I'm believing that one? Oh, totally. totally. And I don't know whether I like that very much. Oh, I try to go to the library at the University of Sussex when I'm doing a project and I always think I should spend much more time here yeah. and not online. Yeah. But maybe he's saying that the heart... That the, the, the relationship between a man and woman is at the heart of everything. Maybe that's the point of the painting. Well, I like that. <laughs> I mean, it could well be. I mean, mm. maybe that's why her dress is all in red. Maybe it's not a coincidence. No. Um, interesting. More mystery, more questions than answers more again. More questions than answers. Here we go again. Um, we'll leave it to you, good, uh, good, <laughs> good listener. I'm going to go and do some colouring. <laughs> right, until next week. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.